as a reminder, our next impact seminar is Tuesday noon, September 6th. Our speaker will be Chris, Dr. Chris Longhurst, Chief Medical Officer and Chief Information Officer at University of California, San Diego. His talk is titled Building a Highly Reliable Learning Health System at UC San Diego. And with that, I will turn it over to Tim Beebe to introduce our speaker and the seminar series. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tim Beebe. I'm Deputy Director of the Center for Learning Health System Sciences, otherwise known as CLASS. I, I still can't get used to that, but I might as well keep using it. Maybe it'll stick. So I'm a, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you all to this uh, second installment of our uh, Center's Eye Impact Seminar Series and to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Priya Rajamani. We look forward to hosting this series monthly as one of our several activities helping to bring a community together and advancing the work of learning health systems. So without further ado, I will introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Priya Rajamani. She's a clinical associate professor in the University of Minnesota School of Nursing, affiliate faculty Institute for Health Informatics, and an informatics consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health. Her background is, is multidisciplinary with training in clinical medicine, public health, and health informatics. And her interests are in the domains of public population health informatics, interoperability, and implementation science. She does collaborative work on informatics projects with colleagues from the School of Public Health, Institute for Health Informatics, and with the Minnesota Department of Health. With Dr. Rebecca Wirtz uh, in the School of Public Health, Dr. Rajamani leads the Training in Informatics for Underrepresented Minorities in Public Health, or TRIUMPH Consortium, designed to train more than 600 students and public health professionals in informatics at universities that, is, is, that have historically served Black, Latinx, and Native American people. It's the first of its kind partnership to help minority students and professional trainees harness the power of public health data to develop disease prevention and well being improvement initiatives in their communities. It's funded by a four year, $7.9 million grant from the US Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology as part of its public health informatics and technology workforce development program. So, just before I, I hand it over to her, just a fun fact um, for Priya, Priya was in the School of Public Health for some time. And uh, she, um, I asked her to craft the uh, uh, schematic that laid out the learning health system science process for our grant application for our Minnesota mentor training program in learning, learning health system science that ultimately ended in an award from Ark and P. Corey to train scholars. So she designed that, that, um, that figure that uh, framed that application and uh, uh, really has received a number of compliments. So that's just a fun fact. She played a role and I'm I, I gonna argue that we probably wouldn't have gotten that training grant without her contribution. So thank you, Priya, for that. So everybody, please um, join me in welcome Dr. Priya Rajamani. The title of her talk today is Perspectives on Public Health Informatics Landscape via a Learning Health System Science Lens. Thank you. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Can you see my slides? Yes, Dr. Rajmani, thank you very much. So um, thank you, Dean Tim Baby, for the introduction. And I'm truly honored to give this presentation. I appreciate the opportunity to share. So the title of my talk is Perspectives on Public Health Informatics Landscape via a Learning Health System Lens. Personally, I have two objectives as part of this presentation. The first one is, I think public health informatics is a black box to many. I would like to shed some light on it. And the second is, as we all know, there are numerous um, subdomains in the field of uh, health informatics. There is a synergy towards um, combining many of those subdomains towards a common framework of population health informatics, and I would like to reinforce that concept. Before I begin, I would like to thank all my collaborators across the various projects that I'm working on. So all the projects I'm going to share are complex and perfect example of team science in action and requires collective brain power for execution. So I would really like to thank my collaborators before I begin. So these are the topics that I would like to touch upon today. First is starting with my informatics journey. 
and giving a high level overview of the public health informatics ecosystem, talking about a couple of public health informatics projects with the learning health system lens, efforts to build up the public health informatics workforce and partnerships to promote public health informatics and learning health systems and ending with alignment of forces and future directions. So a quick glimpse into my background. Um, I'm trained as a physician in India. Since I moved to the US, I completed my graduate degree in public health. This was followed by my biomedical informatics training supported by an NIHNLM fellowship program. I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Larry Gatewood for launching me on this informatics journey. So my doctoral thesis was in public health informatics way back then. Since then, I stayed the course. Right after graduation, I went on to work for our state public health agency, the Minnesota Department of Health. At that time, it was one of the first few, um, uh, few agencies in the entire nation which had, which had a well-functioning informatics unit. Herein, I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Marty Lavencher, for bringing me on board and giving me hands-on public health informatics operational experience. I worked on many different projects from HIT policy, the Minnesota eHealth initiative and hands-on implementation experience with HIT projects in public health. Since then, I shifted over to academia to focus on research and training. My current domains and topics of interest are like in the field of um, public and population health informatics. In general, I've had an affinity to work on projects related to electronic data exchange standards and interoperability, as you will see in my future slides. And then I got my foray into implementation science and my current interest is in the area of learning health systems. I work on a couple of different grants, the Approve and the Triumph grant, which I will talk about. I would also like to emphasize the joint appointment I currently have with the Minnesota Department of Health, which made many of these projects possible. And as part of my faculty appointment, I do teach informatics courses, and most of the service work I do is through the AMEA organization. This is just to give you a flavor of how my journey came about to be and why I do the sort of things that I work on. So giving, uh, moving on to setting the stage for the public health informatics ecosystem. So if you look at the various subdomains in informatics, right in the oval, right in the middle, the maroon bar, um, which starts, uh, which displays the various facets from the micro level to the macro level. So starting from the left end of the spectrum, right, DNA, molecules, disease, and patient, they more so fall into the foray of what I would call like precision medicine, translational bioinformatics, clinical research informatics, and so on. If you move over to the right end of the spectrum, from patient to practice to population and to global level, so the subdomains in informatics are typically clinical research informatics, clinical informatics, nursing informatics, consumer health informatics, public health informatics, global health informatics, and so on. There is an increasing synergy of many of these select subdomains in moving towards a common framework of population health informatics, and really what I would like to underscore that concept. So if you look at a typical public health agency from an informatics perspective, right, public health does receive many different types of data. So it receives individual identifiable data, which comes over to public health as part of, say, mandatory public health reporting requirements. It also receives specimen data and accompanying individual identifiers summary data, environmental health data, and so on. They come in from many different sources. For example, healthcare operations and public actively solicit, public health actively solicits some of the data, for example, inspections, say restaurant inspection data. It also has all the vital records data, for example, birth and death. And they come over to public health for many different purposes. For example, public health surveillance and epidemiology, as part of direct service delivery, for example, um, case management for tuberculosis, community health assessment, and so on. And they get over to public health through many different methods as part of mandatory reporting to public health, some of which could be like efficient, direct, automated processes. And some of the data collection is very manual and labor intensive methods. And many different people and stakeholders are involved in this data schema. 
public health officials, providers in the healthcare delivery system, public payers, and so on. As you can see, public health is a very information intense enterprise. So there is a need for all these data and information to be treated as strategic assets by a public health agency with a well-coordinated informatics approach. Otherwise, it's not going to go well, as we very well saw in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is another way to look at the public health informatics ecosystem. I've listed just the main information systems in public health in the bubble on the left. So many of these systems we might be familiar with. So I'm just going to read out um, all of them just to give a flavor of all the different rich data which resides in these information systems. Going from the top in a clockwise manner, immunization information systems, also called as immunization registries, infectious disease surveillance system, the electronic disease registry, vital statistics system, cancer surveillance system, newborn screening system, the syndromic surveillance system, environmental public health tracking system, injury and trauma systems, and chronic disease surveillance systems. And these, um, this is just the main well-designed information systems. There is a lot of data floating around in Excel files and access databases, which we won't talk about. And these data get over to public health, mainly from as part of clinical en encounters, say from electronic health records. They also get collect from, collected from numerous data sources. And again, these data contain both individual identifiable data and also de-identified summary data. So if you look at the bubble inside the bubble, right? So some of the common principles across these information systems are typically there is a time lag in the data collection and many of these data come in non-standardized formats and there is limited interoperability of these information systems with external systems outside the firewall of public health. There is also limited interoperability within the public health information systems within the firewall of public health. As you can see, this doesn't seem to present a rosy picture of the public health informatics ecosystem but it's about to change for the better. So I wanted to give like a quick glimpse of the LHS framework, the Learning Health Systems framework for folks for whom this concept might be new. So LHS typically is like a, a framework which sort of guides the knowledge, data to knowledge and knowledge to practice cycle in a continuous iterative fashion. The loop, it's a couple of main principles. It has it has to be continuous and it's coordinated by an LHS community driven by informatics. And as we all know, um, none of these happen in vacuum. They occur in the context of um, in an institutional setting. So driven by uh, leadership, culture, incentives, and so on, which I call as the X factors. From what we saw in the prior two slides, it feels like public health is struggling to move through the learning health system cycle for various reasons, right? Outdated technology, limited interoperability, lack of resources, need for more skilled workforce, et cetera. But there is hope on the horizon. So um, if, um, if you think of the, the schema of public health informatics, not just public health informatics, any informatics subdomain for that matter, I think of like two foundational pillars um, in an oval. The first one, the first foundational pillar being a robust informatics infrastructure, and the second pillar being an informatics savvy workforce. And these occur in the context of an institutional setting. So I call them as soft factors or X factors, such as leadership, culture, incentives, and policy, which play a big role in success or failure of many of, many of these initiatives. So I would really like to touch upon all the three uh, things which I mentioned about, and I really hope I'm able to send the message across. The first one, this is um, an informatics infrastructure improvement project. So it's branded as APRU. It stands for Advancing Population and Public Health Reporting and Outcomes with Vaccination Data Exchange. 
In a nutshell, it's an interoperability evaluation project of vaccination data. So what is interoperability? Why should we care about it, right? So interoperability essentially means efficient movement of data across various partners, across various ecosystems, settings, and so on. It's very, very, I feel it's a very foundational element to set, a, to set the stage for a learning healthcare system. So in this interoperability ev evaluation, there are three main information systems which are involved. Two reside within the firewalls of public health. The first one being MIC, which stands for Minnesota Immunization Information Connection, which is the state immunization registry. And the second information system under consideration is MEDS, which stands for Minnesota Electronic Disease Surveillance System, the state re dis disease registry. And then outside of the realm of the firewall is the EHRs in clinical care. So aim one of this grant deals with the development, deployment, and evaluation of a novel interoperability tool for the efficient exchange of vaccination data between MIC and the MEDS electronic system, which, which I'll talk about. And aim two is talking about interoperability evaluation between public health and the outside clinical care sector, which we call it as the evolving interoperability tool. Again, I'll talk more about it. So this grant is funded by an RO3 mechanism from ARC. A special thanks to my study team, Dr. Genevieve Melton, director of our Human LHS Center, Katie White from the School of Public Health, and my colleagues from the Minnesota Department of Health. So we are using the implementation framework, re-aim framework to guide this evaluation. So looking at AIM-1, which is the MIDSMEC MIDS interoperability in more detail. Um, MIC, um, MEDS is the state electronic disease surveillance system. For example, if I get diagnosed with COVID, a record of me, an individual identifiable record of me should technically be reside in meds. So if an epidemiologist want to, wants to say, look at my vaccination status, prior to the deployment of this tool, they literally had to log into the MIG browser using a separate login, look me up in the MIG system, look at my vaccination data and literally like copy paste or manually re-enter the data in meds. So as part of this interoperability, we, we launched a HL7 standards-based query, which we call as a novel interoperability tool, which will create a query from MEDS onto MIC. It will look for data which is specific to me and bring back my HL7 query response with the required vaccination data elements. So the display in the slide shows the data elements which would come back to MEDS as part of this query. So first is the demographics of me as they reside in MEC, and the second is the vaccination history, not just my COVID shots, my entire vaccination history because MEC has the data. And then most importantly, it will also present a vaccine forecasting, which is called the clinical decision support for immunizations. This is important because it's one of the key public health decision supports, which is offered by public health. So reiterating the full schema, right? The post interoperability process, we do a person level, real time query based solution, importantly based on national standards, which populate the vaccination data in the surveillance record. So in a nutshell, that's aim one. Aim two is the interoperability between MIC and EHR. MIC has, already, has always been a little bit ahead in the interoperability game, which is great. So um, if I go to a clinical encounter, for example, I'm going to go get my COVID booster shots. As soon as my visit entry is done and I get the shot and the record is closed, um, typically a HL7 message gets automatically generated from the EHR and gets over to MIC and creates my record in MIC. So this was, this was in existence even prior to the pandemic. And then for example, if my care provider wants to look up my vaccination history, they would do a query to MIC and it would bring in the entire data, which I mentioned about before. My demographics as they reside in MIC, my entire vaccination history, and importantly, the forecasting information. As you can see on the slide on, on the figure on the top, the HL7 query-based um, reporting increased, obviously because of increased COVID vaccinations, 
And more importantly, I wanted to highlight the graph below, which is the HL7 vaccination queries to make. There was an exponential increase in queries, rightfully so, because MIG had a consolidated vaccination history and folks were getting vaccinations from all over the place, not from just their care provider. They, they would go to pharmacies, uh, walk-in clinics and whatnot, and MIG would have a consolidated record for them. Herein, I would like to emphasize the fact that this is a classic public health informatics project, but its impact on care delivery, right, for clinical informatics and nursing informatics is immense because, like, nurses are like the front line of giving shots, looking up vaccination history, etc. So, here in the instead of talking about the subdomains of informatics, I want us to think towards a common framework of population health informatics. So this is another foundational pillar, um, example of a foundational pillar, which is an informatics infrastructure improvement project um, called as the electronic case reporting or the ECR. So the current state of how the disease surveillance data get over into um, a state disease surveillance system is like pretty much all over the board. They come in through Excel files, red cap data entries, electronic lab reporting, non-standardized files, custom files, phone calls, and whatnot. Public health is so gracious to accept all forms of data, try to massage it, reformat it, and somehow gets it over into the disease surveillance system for public health surveillance purposes. As we know, this uh, current state is not sustainable, and it's high time we move towards a future state, which is where the ECR comes in. So ECR, in a nutshell, is an automated real-time exchange of case report information from the electronic health records over to public health agencies. It aims to eliminate the burden of reporting for healthcare providers, for example, infectious disease nurses in the care delivery system and providers are responsible for sending these reports over to public health. And by automating the process, we are doing a significant, um, uh, offering a significant benefit to the healthcare delivery system. Obviously, it also supports the public health by providing data in real time using standardized format. And it leverages a shared services infrastructure. It also offers decision support. And more importantly, it uses national standards for data exchange and interoperability. Herein, I would like to emphasize the fact that though we think of this as a classic public health informatics project being done for the benefit of public health, it's it has immense benefits for the uh, care delivery system. So I want us to think again more of the holistic view of population health informatics. So this uh, presents the ECR schema. I know it's like a super busy slide, but this has all the classic bells and whistles of like an elegant, um, what I call as an elegant informatics infrastructure improvement. So it has um, national standards built into it, both for data representation and for data exchange. It has the decision support built in. It uses a shared services infrastructure hosted for the entire US. And it's, um, it's a truly collaborative effort with many, many stakeholders. Again, team science in action, the EHRs in the care delivery system, the HIT providers, and then many national entities, which I'll talk about, and the various public health agencies. Because it's one of these like cool kids on the block in informatics, I'm gonna take a minute to sort of walk through how the schema works. So if you start from left, going on to the right, so for example, again, me, I get diagnosed with COVID or I, or I have symptoms of COVID. So I go, I have a clinical encounter. It can be a virtual visit as well. So based on my problem list and my diagnosis, the lab results which are offered for me or the lab test results which come back, there are inbuilt codes which are built into the EHRs. These are standardized terminologies. For example, Loink and SNOMED they trigger my ECR, my electronic case report. It gets automatically pushed over from the EHRs onto the centralized infrastructure platform, which is hosted for the entire US. So the green bubble in the middle is the decision support engine, wherein the reportability criteria for the various public health agencies reside. So when my ECR hits that decision support engine based on the rules, 
my ECR feed would get over to the Minnesota Department of Health. So now we are on to the red uh, rectangle on the right. So once the ECR feed comes in, it gets over to the messaging infrastructure hosted in the public health agency, wherein the message is parsed. And then um, a record of me is created in MEDS saying, I think Priya potentially has COVID. So MEDS has a record of it. And also um, a, a duplicate of this file is deposited in the data lake for reporting and analytic purposes. So as you can see on the top of this red rectangle are the public health informations who play a very critical role in orchestrating the schema. Say they authored the rules, which is the green bubble in the middle, which kind of set the reporting criteria, which is very specific to the Minnesota Department of Health. They are responsible for system enhancements in METS for getting the ECR feed in. They also do analytics and reporting using the data lake. And more importantly, they also do outreach and communications with the folks on the left, which is the EHRs, the care, the care delivery systems, the HIT vendors, and so on. Um, and this is a national, so this is not unique to Minnesota. This is like a national setup, which is funded by CDC. And there are three main ent entities involved nationally for um, orchestrating this. The first one is the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The second one is the CSTE, which is the association, main association for epidemiologists. And the third one is the APHL, which is the Association for Public Health Labs. They host the centralized infrastructure, the SHAD services. It's called AIMS, which stands for APHL Informatics Messaging Services. Again, I would like to reiterate the fact that um, it has all the bells and whistles of a classic uh, inf informatics infrastructure project. Again, I would like to look at this in the angle of population health informatics, because though it's being driven by public health, there are immense benefits for the overall care delivery system in general. So now having talk and talked about one of the foundational pillars, right? Another big foundational pillar, I think is an informatics savvy workforce, which I will get to earlier. But also I, um, I had mentioned earlier that none of these occur in vacuum, vacuum as we all know. All of these occur in the context of an institutional setting or an organization. Again, I would like to emphasize those soft factors or X factors play a big role in the failure or success of these initiatives. So we were kind of curious on, we wanted to know what is the role of organizational culture in HIT implementations. So we embarked on a scoping review. Um, so um, this slide displays the Prisma diagram for our scoping review. So after various database searches, we started with about say 3,700 articles. After deduplication, apply, um, applying various screening criteria, um, abstract screening, full text screening, we ended with about 52 articles, which we thought fit the bill of talking about organizational culture in HIT implementations. So we have published this in the Learning Health Systems Journal. Again, call out to my stellar study team, Dr. Genevieve Melton, director of the UMN LHS Center, Gretchen, and to our expert librarian who guided us through this process, Caitlin Baker. So what did we kind of find, right? So we used the um, C4 framework, the consolidated framework for implementation research to guide our scoping review. So we looked at seven different factors in the inner setting of an organization, which can either help uh, a HIT implementation go up or down, right? So these are the seven things that we looked at. Culture stress, culture effort, implementation climate, learning climate, readiness for implementation, leadership engagement, and available resources. So you, you, if you look at the leftmost bar, the culture stress, if culture is considered as a stress factor in an organization, just the perception that it's stressful is going to make an HIT implementation not go well. It's kind of intuitive, but like, nevertheless, the literature says, uh, says it. And then and about 34 articles mentioned that. And then culture as an uh, effort, which essentially is a proxy for facilitator, was mentioned in 27 of the articles. And going over to the right end of the spectrum, leadership engagement was mentioned in about 37 of the articles. So what are the two key takeaway messages? Number one is, we all know that there is a publication bias, right? Only like successful studies make it over to the literature. 
but I personally feel we should be studying failures as much as we study successes, because if we want to set the stage for a well-functioning learning healthcare system, we should know the factors which are not working well. So that personally, I feel is one of the takeaways. And the second one is that, um, as we all know, informatics is a socio-technical field. It's not just the technology which matters. It's again, the context the X factor or the institutional setting in which all this happens. I feel more studies on X factors are needed, you know, leadership, culture, incentives, policy. How do these things like, you know, help the success or the failure of any initiative, not just HIT implementation. So that's like um, one of the three uh, things that I wanted to talk about. So I would like to highlight some of the um, uh, you know, takeaways from the various projects that I talk up, talked about and its implication for LHS. So I talked a lot about um, electronic data exchange and interoperability. It's very, very important, at least in my opinion, because I'm biased towards interoperability, because interoperability essentially in layman language means you're getting the right data to the right person at the right time for effective decision making. So you, we really need to work on these electronic data exchange projects to make those happen. So all the infra information infrastructure projects that I talked about set the stage for an interoperable healthcare ecosystem. And as I mentioned, they involve elements of clinical and public health decision support. And it portrays bi-directional communications across clinical care and public health. It's not just one way push of data like, uh, healthcare delivery system, sending something over to the public health, which is a black hole and then forgetting about it. There is rich data in public health, which can be used for care delivery system as well. So it's a bi-directional loop. And they present the potential of the public and population health informatics. And it highlights the importance of organizational factors. So as I've been harping before, there is a need to evaluate everything that we do. So there is a need um, to underscore and include elements of evaluation in a learning healthcare system. So moving on to the next foundational pillar, an informatics savvy workforce. So I would like to talk about um, the FIT, which is the Public Health Informatics and Technology Workforce Development Program. So this is an initiative funded by the American Rescue Plan and administered by ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. So two aims for this grant. It aims to strengthen the public health informatics workforce. And more importantly, it uh, aims to increase the representation of underrepresented communities within the public health IT workforce. Approximately $73 million were distributed as part of a competitive RFP process. And only 10 grantees across the nation were fortunate to win this grant. And University, was Minnesota, University of Minnesota is lucky enough to get one of those. And this is a consortium-based grant. So they, there are 10 lead entities involved. There are a lot many academic partners and practice partners which are involved in the development and deployment and delivery of this workforce development program. So our consortium is branded as TRIAM, which stands for Training in Informatics for Underrepresented Minorities in Public Health. So we, uh, we received approximately $8 million, and it's a four-year cycle, started in September 2021 through September 2025. Our academic partners are University of Minnesota as the lead entity, and Georgia Southern University and HBCU, historically black college and university to be named shortly. And our practice partners are the Public Health Informatics Institute, the Minnesota Department of Health, Georgia Coastal Health District and Health IE Georgia. So we will be offering the training through a spectrum of modalities. A unique aspect of the SPIT program is stipend supported practice opportunities, which means that it's mandatory that an academic training be accompanied by a real world experience, hands-on experience, say as part of a practicum um, assignment. Again, uh, herein I would like to call and thank the University of Minnesota team, specifically my co-PI, Dr. Becky Woods, and JP Yasmin and Sarah, the School of Public Health team, and Robin Austin, my colleague in the School of Nursing. So as part of this uh, Triumph Consortium, the University of Minnesota School of Nursing will be developing and de uh, delivering a population health informatics and technology, a FIT certificate program. 
and this will be positioned as an interprofessional training across various programs and schools in the university. As I mentioned before, public we need to start thinking in the framework of population health informatics and we intend to offer this across the academic health center. It will also be integrated within the DNP nursing informatics program. And then the University of Minnesota School of Public Health will ramp up its online MPH program with a special emphasis on Native American circles. And as part of this training program, there would be a required foundational public health informatics course and an informatics practicum. So now, now that I've talked about both the foundational pillars and the ecosystem or the soft factors, another one I would like to emphasize on is the partnerships. So um, I would like to specifically emphasize this particular academic practice partnership because I feel it's been mutually beneficial to both sides. So the partners involved are the University of Minnesota School of Nursing and the Minnesota Department of Health. We have been successful in uh, doing many different implementation science projects over in the Department of Health, the ECR, the electronic case reporting, which I talked about, and the MedsMIC interoperability project. And we have had a numerous accepted poster and presentations across many national conferences, AMIA, CST, ERA, many invited talks and so on. So we have published two peer review publications, including the ECR project, which I talked about, which just got accepted in JAMIA. And then we have three more in progress, which is related to the ARC grant. We, also, we have also been successful in receiving grants and also getting fellowship support for the Minnesota Department of Health. Herein, I would like to specifically thank um, the School of Nursing Dean, Dean Connie Delaney, for being a staunch supporter of partnerships and my Minnesota Department of uh, Health colleagues, specifically Emily, Sarah, and Osa, who have been um, very supportive of this partnership and also putting up through the various paperwork to make this happen. So listed here are all my MDH collaborators. I would really like to take, take like 30 seconds to mention their names because they have been stellar colleagues. Emily, Sarah, Osa, Anne, Hannah, Aaron, Naomi, Maureen, Miriam, Jacqueline, Megan, Ali, Chris, and. Anna, uh, and I'm... so this is my um, final slide. So um, this talks about um, alignment of forces and future directions. So based on what we have seen so far, some of the things have been working well, but more work needs to be done. Um, you know, COVID um, was a rude awakening for the need for a robust public health information infrastructure. So there's been numerous investments on that front. So addressing both the foundational pillars, both the information infrastructure and the informatics savvy workforce. Specifically, I would like to mention the data modernization initiative, which is an initiative by CDC to ramp up both the things that I talked about. And then suddenly there's been a realization for the need for an informatics savvy workforce and the ONC SPID development program aims to address that. There is also a need for soft factors, as I call, which play a big factor in the success. And luckily, there's been numerous supportive HIT policies, which are uh, being uh, both developed and deployed to sort of like promote the interoperable healthcare system. Specifically, the CMS promoting interoperability program requires standard-based electronic reporting to public health. So it requires standardized uh, reporting to say immunization registry, ECR, ELR, and so on. And we did hear about the need for an informatics savvy workforce. But if we want to sustain the workforce, there needs to be a change in the accreditation program. Herein, I would like to give a shout out to the AACN Essentials for the School of Nursing. Their updated accreditation criteria has two domains, one two extra domains from their prior ones, one specifically devoted to informatics and one for population health. A shout out to the nursing informaticians for advocating for the advancement of their field. Let's contrast that for a minute with the CIF accreditation criteria for the schools of public health, right? It has one mention of word informatics in the entire accreditation criteria. So unless that changes, it's going to be tough to sustain an informatics savvy workforce. So, uh, so, so more work needs to be done, right? So in terms of... Um, if we have any LHS initiative, there is uh, there needs to be uh, to looked at in the 
in the public health and population health lens. Likewise, many of the informatics initiatives happening in public health needs to be promoted with an LHS framework. And as I've been harping all along, we need to integrate evaluation, evaluation components and HIT implementations to support the learning healthcare system. And we need to advocate for resources to speed up the data information knowledge cycle for learning healthcare systems. I started with a thank you to my collaborators and mentors. I would like to end with a note of uh, all my stellar uh, contributors across the board. As, I mean, as noted, all these projects are super complex and cannot be executed without collective brain power. My sincere apologies if I forgot to mention anybody accidentally, but thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Rajmani. Well, we have about 17 minutes or so remaining for uh, uh, Q&A. If you have questions or comments, thank you for those that have already been submitting questions to the Q&A. Uh, please use raise your hand or type them into the Q&A uh, box by clicking on the button. Uh, please note that in addition to questions, the audience may have directly related to Dr. Rajmani's talk. We also welcome questions exploring the many facets and dimensions where Dr. Rajmani's presentation connects with learning health systems, patients, communities, etc. And with that, we'll jump into questions. The first one I see is uh, Rabina Rizvi. So Dr. Rajmani, does MICC communicate with data residing outside the state of Minnesota? So you mean the make the Minnesota immunization registry? So right now, um, you know, it's it's kind of hard to do like what you call like interest, interstate like immunization data exchange. But there is a project which is similar to ECR, which is moving towards a national infrastructure. It's called the Immunization Gateway Project. So we are not there yet, but slowly getting there is what I would say. Thank you. The next question is from Tim Jenkins. What approaches can an organi can organizations take to increase project management skills, especially the soft skills, in order to enhance and accelerate the advancement of interoperability? That's a super good question. So many of these skills, like when I graduated, I hardly had any of them, is, I, is what I would say. We just learn on the fly. <laughs> um, I think like, you know, um, again, project management, change management are not typically included in an informatics training program, but I think they should be. The next question, Rebecca Wirtz. Fantastic presentation, Priya. Here's my question. Communicable disease reporting is the most straightforward, not easiest, but supported by law, informatic standards, history, et cetera, use case for electronic exchange of health data. Why has it proven to be so difficult? Yeah, good. I think probably, um, you know, um, the information infrastructure was not ready on either side to kind of move towards this national vision that I just shared about. Like, you know, it took a long while for folks to get onto the electronic uh, platform. And then though uh, healthcare delivery systems had EHRs in place, you need to incentivize them to change behaviors. Otherwise, people were using the EHRs to kind of create bugsy reports for various infectious disease reporting, and then faxing them over to public health. It completely defeats the purpose of having an EHR in place. On the contrary, public health was also not ready to receive. So the entire ecosystem, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle, like all the partners should be ready to kind of fit the pieces in place. And I think, um, sad or not, actually COVID has proven to be a rude awakening, which has actually probably benefited public health in some ways in terms of informatics improvement. I hope that answered Becky's question. She says, yes, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Rebecca. Uh, next question, Brian Jarabek. 
apologies if I'm saying your name correctly, uh, incorrectly. One of the biggest challenges to set up informatic systems for public health I see is the trust between health systems and the Department of Health. What do you think will foster this trust and partnership? Thanks, Brian. For some reason, I've never thought it was the trust which was the hindrance. I always thought it was the technology which is the hindrance. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are like you know, even even if you have an electronic data exchange in place, right? It's laborious to actually before you click the send button, right? You need to have all data use agreements in place. But even for that, there is like. Um, centralized data use agreements, which can be repurposed. One is called as a TEFCA and even the ECR, right? So you don't have to do like individual uh, agreements between entities, for example, M Health Fairview with the Department of Health, Hennepin Care with the Department of Health. You get on this common TEFCA bandwagon, the data use agreement, which supports data exchange. So hopefully that sort of addresses the trust barrier. To be frank, Brian, I never thought Trust was a hiccup. I used to think like um, public health is considered more holistic and people are like happy to send the data over, <laughs> but maybe I'm wrong. But I think definitely as part of these new informatics enhancements, you know, it, people are not just working on the technology, they are also working on the legal framework on the side, which is going to be super helpful. Well, I may have overlooked if there are any hands raised. Apologies if there are. Um, Brian has a follow-up question here in the Q&A. The agreements and funding is one of the biggest barriers and takes trust. Totally agree the technology has come a long ways. Thanks, Brian. Other questions? We have a hand raised. Go Priya. ahead, Genevieve, thanks. Hi, Priya. Uh, my question to you is any advice you would have? So you talked about your pathway, but um, maybe insights that you might want to share with somebody that's thinking about um, you know, doing what you do. Yeah, I would say like, I think we need to think outside the box. Um, I've always like enjoyed doing collaborative work. So one of the things is like, even when I came over to academia, like, you know, I kind of knew that I have to, I have to fit in this academic box, right? I have to be rapidly publishing and like, you know, my goal has to be n number of publications, but I've always thought that I want to make an impact, not in terms of number of publications I have, but in the work I do, right? So, so I've really gone and solicited those kind of projects after this, hard work for two years, we got one publication. Yeah, but that's great. That is in Jamia, top-notch journal. That's what I want. I don't want to have <laughs> 10 publications, like even the author doesn't read after a little while. <laughs> but I, again, um, so, I, so one of the things I've actively gone about soliciting high impact projects, um, the second one is I think you should just be open-minded and explore. There is lots of opportunity. I think right now it's like a super good time to be in informatics. There are so many exciting things happening. Um, I would, and my advice is just jump in. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Rajamani, for taking the time to present at this, the Class Impact Seminar. And thanks all for attending. Again, a reminder, the next impact seminar uh, is Tuesday at noon on September 6th. Our speaker will be Dr. Chris Longhurst, Chief Medical Officer and Chief Information Officer at University of California, San Diego. This concludes our presentation. We'll see you next time. Look for those links on our page. And thanks so much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Bye.